Thank you very much. Yeah. It was um, an East European um, Prime Minister who said that um, when you as a public official visit or attend a business meeting or summit such as this and you get the very cold applause that I got, uh, it means that you have either introduced a bad tax or you're about to introduce one. Uh, both, both I might say that I might be guilty of uh, th that possibility. So I uh, nevertheless thank you very much for uh, the very kind uh, reception. <laughs> now that really looks like an inducement not to introduce <laughs> a bad tax. Thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation to be here and my gratitude also to members uh, of the chamber for the very warm uh, welcome. I'm honored to have this opportunity to engage with this very distinguished gathering of business leaders and uh, investors. Such is the dynamism, quality and caliber of the membership of the chamber that your views are considered crucial in national economic policy discourses and processes. But let me set the tone for this uh, dialogue this morning, by this afternoon now, by stating right away that it is imperative, and we consider it as a government imperative, to restore Nigeria to the path of faster growth in 2020, 2021, 2022, and beyond. This is, and, and this is important, not just in order to fully recover uh, from the uh, effects of recession largely caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also essential because we need a growth rate that is faster than current population growth so that there is at least enough to go around. But these development ambitions, as you know, are vulnerable to local and global events. So as we cope with the fallouts of the COVID-19 pandemic, we also have to factor in the need to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And, and this point has been made uh, very eloquently by uh, the president of the chamber. And the relentless march of the digital economy and of course the fourth industrial revolution. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic precipitated not only a global health crisis, but it also triggered a socioeconomic crisis that affected every part of the world. For us, it was clear, it was clear that we were facing a near disaster. GDP contracted, as you are very familiar, uh, to, to, to the tune of about minus 6.10% during the second quarter of 2020. Oil price at one point was about $10 a barrel. And of course, this was almost less than the cost of production. And then finally settled at about $45 a barrel during the second quarter of 2020. Unemployment went up to 33.3% in the fourth quarter of 2020. The transportation sector declined by 49%. Hospitality by 40%. Education declined by 24%. Trade declined by 17%. Construction, which of course is a big area for us, by 40%. Now, in response to this, the president directed that I should set up a team of ministers and interagency heads and uh, agency heads to develop a 12-month economic emergency plan, which became known as the Economic Sustainability Plan. We were clear that the only way of avoiding an economic disaster that could last for years was for government to essentially put forward a major fiscal stimulus plan. So we put in place a stimulus plan in the order of about 2.3 trillion naira. Half of that was, of, was going to be in the form of credit to various sectors of the economy. The plan, the Economic Sustainability Plan, emphasized rapid health interventions, keeping businesses going, creating and protecting jobs, boosting local production, and providing social protection 
for the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable sections of our society. The plan also included a suite of macroeconomic policies, including fiscal grants, tax breaks, regulatory forbearance to banks, as well as reduced interest and moratorium on CBN intervention facilities, amongst other actions. In addition, the plan created what we named the MSME Survival Fund, which was designed to keep as many junior private sector workers as possible employed and paid while uh, within a period of three months during the course of, 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 the, uh, of what we regarded as the most critical period after uh, the pandemic uh, struck. Up to about 1.1 million people benefited from this uh, particular intervention. These interventions paid off as we had a very short recession and we're now seeing a rebound in economic activity with growth uh, at about 5.01% in the second quarter of uh, this year and 4.03% in the third quarter. Now, it's clear uh, to us that, I mean, there are all sorts of people who say all sorts of things oh, about the growth, uh, its base effect, is this and that. But I think the important thing is what do we do going forward? And I think it's clear to us that if we are to achieve accelerated growth, then we must adopt a new strategic direction and policy orientation. So it was with this objective in mind that the Federal Executive Council recently signed off on the new medium-term national development plan. That's the 2021 to 2025 plan to which uh, the President of the Chamber had referred. The strategic objectives of the medium-term plan include establishing a strong foundation for a diversified economy, investing in critical infrastructure, enabling human capital development, and improving governance and strengthening security. Now, the implementation of the plan is expected to be sustained by a range of measures, fiscal, monetary, and trade measures, including, of course, as you've also heard, reformation of subsidy regimes and a better functioning foreign exchange market. The cornerstone of the strategy is boosting productivity by focusing on value addition as a guiding principle for all sectors, especially agriculture, manufacturing, uh, solid minerals, digital services, tourism, hospitality, and entertainment. Value added is the key. In agriculture, for example, just as we seek to increase production, say, of rice, we are paying equal attention to other parts of the value chain such as storage, transportation, processing, marketing, the introduction of commodity markets, and we have two private ones now and the public one. Similarly, in the mining sector, we recognize that exploitation and extraction will not create the jobs. Our aim is to focus on resource beneficiation and, of course, development of the local industry so that we can create wealth all along the mineral value chain. There are a number of cardinal principles of the strategic direction which is enshrined in our national development plan. The first is the centrality of job creation. All programs and policies are viewed from the lens of the number of jobs, direct and indirect, that they will create. And this is important because it also would influence the sorts of incentives that we will be giving sectors of the economy. Because when, you, when, when we look at sectors that will create the opportunities, obviously those are the sectors that must be supported and must be given the right sorts of incentives. Secondly, the loosening of restrictions on trade. We believe that generalized restrictions on trade are counterproductive, especially when they impede the ability of local industries to procure critical inputs. Our focus instead will be on allowing import of goods to which value can be added before domestic consumption or export. The focus, as I said, must be on value addition. When implemented in full, a strategic orientation of becoming a value-adding economy will help create a number of good-paying jobs. To give some context, or, you know, uh, just by way of a reference, Vietnam, before COVID-19, Made, uh, had ready-made garments, and that sector employed 3.5 million people. This is just ready-made garments. While the tourist sector in Egypt, for example, employed 2.5 million people. 
So we think that just creating situations where value can be added, even if it means importing components, just to be able to add that value, we think that that is really uh, the way to go. Although the federal government has undertaken direct interventions in creation of jobs, and there are several direct in interventions, I think one should emphasize that our recruitment, for example, of up to 1.5 million young people in the Empire Scheme, over two or three cohorts now, was just scratching the surface of the problem because we have well over two million young people entering the workforce every year. So there's no doubt that it is the private sector that has to thrive in order to create the number and kinds of jobs that we need. But it's also important for Nigerian youth, you know, just in that process, to acquire the skills and knowledge of the workplace. And this is why we've tried to introduce quite a few programs, working with development partners, working with, uh, with development finance institutions and some finance institutions. For example, working with the United Nations Development Program, the European Union and other partners, we introduced what is called the Jubilee Fellowship Program. Now this is a one-year work placement program for 20,000 young Nigerians and it will kick off in January. Every year, we'll have 20,000 young Nigerians who are placed in the private sector and public sector, and they are paid by a special grant that we, between, and that grant is covered by the federal government, uh, the uh, UNDP, as well as the EU. And so over a five-year period, we expect that 100,000 young people will be strategically placed in uh, the, the private sector, learning uh, work skills and all that. And after the year, they, are then, uh, they, they can then be released into, into the market. But we'll pay them for that, uh, for that whole year uh, while they are uh, going through internship in, in the, any of the private and, of course, the public sector. Another key idea that the new plan advocates is stopping the resort to demand management as a first policy option. So it envisages a movement away from the strategy of managing limited supplies to one of expanding the supply base of food and manufacturers, as well as with regard to electricity uh, supply, petroleum products, and foreign exchange. All of these areas, we think that we must de-emphasize uh, demand management. It also prioritizes the export of goods and services beyond crude oil, and the exports is an important aspect, of course, of the uh, entire development plan. And we're building on the export expansion facility program under the Economic Sustainability Plan. Technology and tech-enabled businesses will be a major focus in the coming years. And I think that the stories that we're hearing from the sector are encouraging. As of this year, more than six such companies, tech-enabled companies, mainly in the, uh, in the fintech space, have been named unicorns. And as you know, a unicorn is a company that is worth over a billion US dollars. Six of those companies started in 2016 in the middle of two recessions, between 2016 and now, in the middle of two recessions and a global health crisis. But these companies employ hundreds of young men and women in well-paying jobs here and abroad. And we believe that the right regulatory environment was and will remain critical in growing this sector. Now, an example is the establishment of the Technology and Creativity Advisory Group, which was established under uh, the directive of the president. And this group brings together public and private sector stakeholders and helps to formulate new policies, including banking policies, to accommodate new tech-enabled payment systems. Now, a lot of these tech companies, the fintech companies, benefited from uh, some, of the new, uh, some of the new policies that were, draft, that were crafted by uh, the technology and advisory group, the, technolo the technology advisory group. Now, one of those policies is, this, is the one that enabled the central bank to be able to issue licenses other than banking licenses for companies that are involved in payment systems. So a lot of these companies who would have had to become banks by force and pay 25 billion, of course, wouldn't have 25 billion. So because of the work of, the, uh, of, the, of this group, of the advisory group, 
and uh, a lot of the effort put in by the central bank as well, the CBN was able to issue new types of licenses for payment processing. And this helped a great deal in expanding the space for, for fintech companies. The Advisory Group on Technology and Creativity also articulated the need to strengthen ecosystems to support digital and creative sectors. And this resulted in the conceptualization of a $600 million investing in digital and creative enterprise program. It's called the iDice program. That's a program that's supported by the AFDB, by the African Development Bank. And uh, we hope that it will become operational in the first quarter of 2022. So the new development plan uh, envisages an investment commitment in the order of about 348 trillion naira over the plan period, that's over the five year period. And of, of course, of that portion, government is expected to come up, come up with about 49.7 trillion, roughly about 14%, while the private sector is expected to invest 298 trillion, or about 86%. So the success of the plan depends greatly on a strong partnership between the public and private sectors, because we realize that if the private sector does not is not able to come up with his own part of the deal, obviously uh, the plan itself fails. This is why in order to encourage the private sector, the federal government has taken and will take deliberate steps to improve the business environment by enabling more speedy transactions, removing bureaucratic obstacles, and, and we've started doing so by the uh, very first executive order that was issued, 001, uh, which was on promoting transparency and efficiency in the business environment, and 003, promoting support for local content in public procurement, which had a similar objective in mind. Of course, the devil, as they say, is in the detail. In our case, the devil is in the implementation. And I think that we're going to have robust conversations around that, hopefully, uh, when we take the question and answer. This government has always emphasized that the private sector has a key role to play in our efforts to build a more resilient and competitive economy. Private companies are engaged in design, construction, logistics, and the financial components of national infrastructural projects. So just as we are fully conscious that good infrastructure is vital to enable the private sector to be efficient and competitive, we also see their role in all of the developments of infrastructure and in all the key areas of the economy. This is why we are now able to use the uh, Buja Kaduna Railway, Lagos Ibadan Railway, and talk about the near completion dates for the second Niger Bridge, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, the Abuja Kano Expressway, and the Abuja Kaduna um, Kano Gas uh, Pipeline. The infrastructure story will be taken up in, in notch higher when we get to the point where the Infraco, the 15 uh, trillion Naira infrastructure fund being set up in partnership again with the private sector takes up uh, fully. So it's of course important, you know, to try and shape the future, the future trajectory of our country. And I, we hope that the structures that help to articulate the medium term plan will come out with a longer term vision for uh, 2050. Meanwhile, we've been working with a group of uh, distinguished Nigerians, some of who are here, on the Futures Project called Imagine Nigeria, where we've called on young people as well to share their dreams about Nigeria of the future and specify some of the things that they, they think will need to be done in order to get there. We hope to be able to share the reports of this project very soon as one of the things that uh, it emphasizes is the articulation of a new national narrative a more positive one that aims to highlight our successes as a nation, forge cohesion amongst our people, and foster a sense of community and common interest in our vibrant and dynamic nation. Another issue it addresses is how Nigeria should always position itself to play a leading role in Africa. The ongoing progress in the establishment of the African continental free trade area is pertinent uh, in this regard. Government worked very closely with the private sector to undertake the AFCTA impact and readiness assessment before signing up to the treaty. We 
we, we delayed signing off on that treaty for almost a year to ensure that private sector contribution was taken uh, into account. The private sector is also part of the National Action Committee for the implementation of the AFCTA, co-chaired by the Honorable Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment and the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. The work of the committee is vital to ensure that we can participate effectively in the free trade area once trading starts. The private sector must also contribute to the articulation of the national trade strategy. They must provide support to our negotiators in the AFCTA process while taking full advantage of the opportunities provided by this free trade area. As things stand, negotiations on the rules of origin, which of course are very important for boosting local production, are nearing completion, over 87% completion, with outstanding work of about 10% on textiles and about 2% relating to automobiles. In services, 41 countries have made offers, uh, but uh, these offers, of course, are still to be verified. They face two negotiations on investments, intellectual property, and competition at very early stages, while the conversations on women and youth and trade and digital trade have not even begun yet, but we expect that they will start soon. So let me conclude then by reiterating the need for Nigeria to strive to achieve high and sustained growth in order to, uh, to create the opportunities for our people and to overcome poverty. Our responses must promote productivity and value addition and move away from the despair of managing limited resources to producing and creating more in a competitive and sustainable manner. I expect that the private sector, on which so much depends and, so, and which of course is so well represented here, will rise up to help Nigeria achieve these great objectives by working closely with government. Thank you very much for your kind attention.